Hello and welcome to Dr. VGP Talk Show. Hello and welcome to Dr. VGP Talk Show that reaches 42 million households, including 2 million households across Chicago land. We have with us this afternoon, our guest today is none other, Congressman Danny K. Davis, who's a household name, not only in Chicago land, but across America and beyond. Welcome, Honorable Congressman Danny K. Davis to Dr. VGP Talk Show. We are delighted to have you with us today. We are here at Congressman Danny K. Davis office, which is in his congressional district in on California and Madison, I could say very well in the hood. <laughs> uh, Congressman Davis, you're a living legend today, being 44 years in politics, being 11 years at an, as the alderman of the 29th Ward from 1979 to 1990, six years as the Cook County Commissioner from 1990 to 1996, and elected in 1997, sworn in as the Congressman for the 7th Congressional District. have been serving as the congressman for the last 25 years. This is a true success story that the people have embraced you over and over and again, and the people want you to finish your unfinished task for the people of West Side and South Side. Could you tell us, you know, one of your favorite quotes before I start the interview is, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. Congressman Danny K. Davis, could you tell us about your early childhood? I know you were son of a sharecropper in Park, uh, Arkansas, Parksdale. Your daddy was known as H.D. Hezekiah D. Davis, and you're named after your dad. And you have spent long hours sometimes in the cotton fields, uh, uh, but and you became such a powerful orator today, such an intelligent personality, having earned a doctorate from the Union University in Ohio, your master's degree from Chicago State University, and also you had your bachelor's degree from Parksdale, Arkansas. Tell us, how was your early childhood? Well, Dr. Vijay, let me just say how delighted I am to be on your show and to be with you. You know, I often sum up my life as life has been great. I, I, I've i been, if you go to church, I'd say I've been blessed. If you believe in luck, I would say I've been a very fortunate, lucky individual. I grew up in rural Arkansas in what we call the Arkla Miss area, meaning that it was an area in the corner of the state where Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi all came together, converged. <laughs> well, 10 miles from the Louisiana line, 25 miles from the Mississippi River, and in Arkansas in a very fairly new town i'm saying my folks migrated there from alabama at the turn of the century in the early 1900s my father's father had died and his mother had five children so she came on the other side of the family 
my mother's family came, and ultimately, of course, they all met and all of that. But the town was new, and people came there looking for new land to farm. The land where they lived in Alabama had worn out. out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I discovered that when people talk about George Washington Carver and his experimentation with soil and all of that, my father knew about that, but he didn't know anything about the technical stuff. He just knew that they moved because <laughs> the land had worn out and there was no way to farm. So they came to Arkansas. To look for fresh pastures. Cut down the trees, made farmland, wow. and, and built things. My cousin graduated from high school by himself. When I was sixth grade, his sister and I were sixth grade, and he was twelfth grade. Wow. Aubrey graduated, and we had, because we graduated from sixth grade. Great. We had to wait for him to finish. We always joked because he was very slow, and he had to march up to the front of the church, <laughs> go through his whole graduation, and then we could graduate. And so he was the only graduate in his class. Wow, in incredible. And well, his sister, who had been a couple of years or so older than he, had to go away to go to high school. She had to go to another That's place. Nice. And other kids who actually, they had a bunch of very smart people in the town, but they just didn't have schools and all that kind of stuff. So you go and live with a relative in another town or you go to a boarding school once you finished the eighth grade. John H. Johnson had to come to Chicago. He lived a few miles from where I grew up in Arkansas, Arkansas. City, Arkansas. But when he graduated from eighth grade, there was no high school that African-Americans could go to in that town. Down. I actually went with him to that town when they moved the house he lived in from out in the field downtown next to the courthouse. It was a two-room shotgun house. And when people say shotgun, what they really meant is if you went through the front door, you could shoot a bullet and go out the back door. My uh, God, it's such, <laughs> such, such. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you go straight through. No. And that's where he lived. And I happened to go down when they went to dedicate his house and all that. But it was new area, new town, new this, new that, new everything. So the infrastructure was not necessarily all that great. There's such history, Congressman, you're giving us. And I could also, I read, and you told me that as a young kid, there was no electricity in your home until 1951, and you read with a coal oil lamp. Oh, we didn't get electricity until I was 10 years old. As a matter of fact, and my mother used to admonish me because she'd catch me reading and say, you're going to ruin your eyes trying to read by this little lamp. Right. And I'd wait until they go to sleep. <laughs> and then I'd read anyway. But when the Rural Electrification Act was passed, Pass. that's when people who lived in the rural parts got electricity. And so I got interested in the stuff real early, because I wanted to know the REA, they called it, and say the REA is coming, and we're going to get electricity. And sure enough, when it came, it was as if the world lit up. I'm, I'm saying 
Absolutely. At night. Yeah. Darkness to light. I mean, it must have been a huge difference. Oh, it made all the difference. I mean, you could see where people lived at night because you'd see the light through the windows. Uh, you know, you'd know that the house was here or uh, there. And so it was a very different kind of life. But people were optimistic. They believed in possibility. They were faith-oriented. And so even though somebody reading it would think that this is terrible stuff, we thought they were situations to be overcome. And so we just knew even the blues singers would, would write songs that said it, trouble in mind, I'm blue, but I won't be blue always. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Very true. I mean, the sun's going to shine in my front door. Well, I mean, that's optimism. And, and so we had a lot of that. You've seen it all, Congressman Davis, from the work reading in the night, like you said, after your parents go to sleep. What was your favorite book, Uncle Tom's Cabin? Uh, somebody gave me a copy of Uncle Tom's Cabin. I don't know where I got it from. But I must have read it at least 10, 15, 15 times. 20 times and made the mistake one day and left it out in the, in, on the tree. It rained. And you lost Oh, it. my book was gone. And I, oh, I was devastated. That. I could name all the, 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 Character. the characters in the book. By heart. <laughs> Topsy <laughs> and whoever. But, but reading actually was my escape. It was my way out of what may have been a dreadful, boring type situation. Past, past time. I mean, once I learned to read, my God. And, and I worked for a fellow who would save his newspapers for me. On Saturday, I'd go down to clean his yard, and he didn't know it. But he'd always leave his papers for me. Arkansas Democrat, Arkansas Gazette. Yes, yes, I would have cleaned his yard for nothing <laughs> just to get, to get those, those newspapers. Papers. So it, it, it was wonderful. Great teachers, people who would help you drink up information, knowledge of uh, you know, the little quips and stuff. That I think I you made. had a natural passion to read whatever you could get your hands on. You were a voracious reader. You were a self-driven educator. I mean, you had, uh, you are an exceptional child. It's not only the church going aspect. And I heard that you had a pocket money of six cents a week. Mm -hmm. And one cent used to go into the Sunday school collection and the nickel goes to the church collection. Oh, that was it. People taught you that no matter what you had, you ought to be able to share it. And so our allowance on a Sunday was six cents. You, 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 you'd put the penny in the Sunday, in the Sunday, Sunday school, school collection and then for the general election at church, you would put the, put put the, nickel. the nickel. And sometimes boys would try to cheat a little bit and knock on the table and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. You know how kids will be kids. But the wonderful thing is the adults. The adults were so positive. And so I, my buddy and I, fellow named Haywood Davidson, we kind of thought we were, you know, pretty cool. We'd read and stuff like that. But we used to be amazed at how our parents appeared to know so much and other people knew so much, and yet they didn't go to school. I'm, 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 That's true. Mm -hmm. I'm saying my father finished, we say finished, we don't know that he finished, but we saw his report card where he was 19 years old and in the fourth grade. Oh my God. Okay. And yet, he had so much when knowledge. he would 
pray and public praying and all of that. He was great. I mean, he, he, and he always was proud of the fact, but I also noticed he'd be reading his Sunday school book on a Sunday morning, sitting on the porch. And I think the fact that he read a lot caused me to, to want to read. And my mother read. And so they were both readers. And that kind of drove me to want to do what they were doing. And so I became a reader. Fantastic. And you also were elected as an alderman of 29th Ward in 1979. I would call it the era of the first black mayor in Chicago, Harold Washington. How would you describe Mayor Harold Washington? Well, you know, as I got involved, and I never intended really to become a politician or an elected official, that was not my drive. I was working, I got involved in community and began to learn things, working for not-for-profits. But I, I, I noticed that not-for-profits and leaders could advocate, but it was the elected folks who made the actual decisions, the policies. And that kind of intrigued me. I was asked to be chairman of a committee to find ourselves a candidate to run for the city council. People in my community said they wanted to do that. We couldn't find anybody to run. And I ran into the gentleman who was the alderman, and he was kind of, we call it selling wolf tickets. And he says, oh, I know you all saying what you're going to do to me, and you can't even find a candidate. So I went home that night and said to my wife, you know, I think I'm going to run for alderman. She says, who are you? I said, well, yeah, me, why not? She said, you can't run for alderman. You're not even a precinct captain. And I said, well, you don't really have to be a precinct captain. I said, probably help if, if you was. So we decided to run, and we had run a candidate Cliff Do Well White. His family still runs Do Well's Fish Market. Wow. We had run Cliff Do Well White four years before then. The alderman had died. Alderman Biggs, Robert Biggs, who was an undertaker. Cliff got into a runoff. People burned down his cleaners. Oh, my God. Destroyed his building. Um, so he just went back to Mississippi and started growing catfish and later on started bringing the catfish back to Chicago. Chicago. And that's how his family's catfish Fish. business is right at Pulaski today at Vinton Fifth Ray. Avenue. Yeah, they, they, you go there right now and get some new whales catfish. 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 But, it, 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 but I did run. People responded, and I got into a runoff. And that's why I say if you can get in a runoff, oftentimes you can win in those kind of elections. I won and became the alderman of the 29th Ward and made a pledge to the people that I would provide opportunity for them to be engaged in every public decision that we made. If there was a zoning change, we'd vote on it. If there was a decision to be made about anything going on in the community, they would vote on it. We'd vote on it. We had the People's Assembly. And I pledged to the people that if they would vote on issues and discuss the issues, whatever position they would take, I would take that that would become our position. So we had a wonderful time. Harold Washington uh, was, people were making noise and all of that about uh, who's going to be mayor and we're learning. I had supported and we supported Jane Byrne. 
the same time that I ran. And that's when Jane Byrne got elected mayor of the city of Chicago. But I had started to run with the groups, uh, Timia Black, Roscoe Bola, people who were activist oriented, people who, um, you know, I gravitated to people like David Ord, Marty Oberman, Marion Bellini, Larry Bloom, uh, Cliff Kelly, <laughs> and all of this group, which was a small part in the city council, it was often, the votes would often be 46 to four sometimes, 45 five, to five, five. Okay. <laughs> 44 to six. And, and, and so we were known as a little independent group Good. in the Chicago okay. City okay. Council. And, you know, uh, Alderman at that time in 80s, Alderman Tim Evans, Alderman Ed Smith and, and yourself were like a trio for when our Mayor Harold Washington was the mayor. You all were the three top prominent black aldermen in the mid 80s, early 80s, where everybody used to look up to. Yep. Ed got elected along with um, Harold being elected in 83. But Ed Smith and I had met each other when we were both teaching school at the Magellan EVG Center. And both of us had come from the rural South. So we just kind of automatically became friends. And we used to go and visit our parents. Ed's mother still lived in Mississippi. My parents lived in Arkansas. And we would, because you could go right through my town to on into Mississippi. Mississippi. And we would drive down. It had a little Volkswagen. Didn't didn't burn much gas. Yeah, <laughs> and smaller. so we were activists, engaged, involved. Both got elected, and we like to think that we changed the tenor of politics on the west side of the city of Chicago, in particular, and were part of changing the citywide pieces at all, working with, with, with people like the group I just mentioned. And ultimately, now we see what we have today. And of course, Harold Washington really was a big force in 83 when he managed to get elected and then unfortunately didn't live much long longer after the 87 re-election but it was enough to put chicago and already chicago because people like leon dupre and, and and i'm saying bob merriam a lot of people nothing changes overnight Nothing is instant, nothing is immediate, but all of those people and all of those things, the Jesse Jackson influence, the labor influence with Charlie Hayes and Jim Wright, people who helped move Chicago out of the shadows into the light. light. And, and Harold Washington loomed as the brightest light <laughs> of them all. So very well said, Congressman. You know, you're referred to, as you rightly said, the people's congressman. You always take the people uh, into consideration before making a decision. Uh, it's never a one-man decision after being elected. You know, recently, I think day before yesterday, you celebrated the 43rd annual back to school parade which you originated when you first elected as an alderman in 1980 could you tell us about 43 years consistently i think nobody is doing and nobody has done a back to school parade for the children of your district well you know being a teacher in the chicago public schools but also having this understanding that education was 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 
driven into our thoughts and minds. And people would always say, if you learn something, if you know something, nobody can ever take that away from you, that that becomes a part of your being, that becomes a part of you. So trying to motivate, stimulate, activate young people to value education um, has always been a part of my adult life. And so whether it was teaching directly or trying to teach indirectly, this parade was a way of trying to help do it. So we started the parade after my first election. We take pride in saying that we've been rained on, but never rained out. out. <laughs> and, and so we started and people joined in. And every year it just kept going, getting a little bigger. <clears throat> more people engaged, more people involved. I run into people today, sometimes in different places. I was in Houston, Texas, a lady came up. She was manning one of the booths at this SBA conference. And she say, have you ever heard of Danny's Angels? And I said, well, she knew I'd heard of that. I said, of course I have. She said, well, I was one of Danny's angels. <laughs> How is Mrs. Stanabeck? Well, Mrs. Stanabeck was the lady who started organized it. the Danny's angels, angels. And she died a few years ago. She was 101. Wow. But at her 100th birthday, she was dancing a gig. <laughs> I oh, mean, my God. She lived on, on, on Adam Life. Street. Oh, there's so many people. The other day, I discovered that Nancy B. Jefferson's granddaughter yes, so was you know. promoted to the highest level of employment that a civilian can have working for the United States government. Wow. She had reached the SES ranks, wow. the Senior Executive, Executive Service. Service. And she is, and, and her father still lives right on Jackson Boulevard, across from Merillac House, where Nancy Jefferson lived. Yeah. And when I saw this lady that was getting this, this, this promotion, and I said, that's Nancy's granddaughter. Nancy was used to be a powerhouse on the West Side. She served on the City Police Commission. She was on the member. police. Actually, Jane Byrne appointed her, her and she yes. continued I, I met her. Rise. But she also was the real force behind pushing Mayor Harold Washington to appoint uh, Leroy Martin to As be the, the superintendent of policeman. Police. Uh, given the fact that uh, Superintendent Martin came from the West Side and and the West Side, you know, that's a whole effect, other okay. story in and of itself. But I, I never forget, I tell the story. We were meeting with Mayor Harold Washington. Nancy was sick. She had cancer. And she actually had cooked dinner. And so we were getting ready to eat and she just wasn't feeling well so she went and and got in bed to lay down and she wouldn't leave the door open so she could talk through and she said don't y'all eat all them biscuits from norvell <laughs> <laughs> her husband's name was no, norvell no. and she said everybody knew mr jefferson liked biscuits <laughs> she said don't eat all them biscuits, biscuits. from norvell <laughs> But yeah, we had a lot of fun with that. And actually, her son and his friends had a Nancy Jefferson Fest last Saturday. Wow, wow. Right in front of, there's a little park area there in front of the house. And so they did that in honor. We used to call her 
you know, the Mother Teresa of the West Side. Yeah. The West Side. I met a couple of times. Yeah. Ella Daggett. Does that name ring a bell? She was also one of the women in the West Side. Well, Austin. Nancy was in the Garfield area. Yes. Yes. Daggett. Yes. Daggett yes. was in the Austin area. Exactly. I, I used to sit with both of them. Yeah. The well, these were powerful women, women who helped hold together. Yeah. Correct. This area that some people thought was going to an become eclectic. an absolute slum. Right. But each area, there was a very powerful female force. Earlene Lindsay was one of those. Directing Nancy that. Jefferson was one of those. Eleanor Daggett, Daggett was, was one of that. those. Mary Alice Moe Henry <laughs> was all one the of things. those. And in the Lundale area, it was a woman named Rosemary Love who was a county commissioner at one point, but now they are all gone. But but they were influential people who held the area together. And one of the reasons that things are what they are right now and changing the way they are changing can be attributed to the work of these, these women. At Great. Congressman, you were one of the few congressmen during the COVID time who brought the largest amount of money of nearly $1 billion to the 7th Congressional District. And 7th Congressional District boasts, I would say, of the largest number of educational institutions, including healthcare institutions in any one congressional district across the country. Uh, what do you think needs to be done more? What is your unfinished task? for the 7th Congressional District and for the people? Well, we're activist-oriented, I'm, right. I'm saying. And, and much of the work that took place to make sure people were, you know, protected, volunteers. I, I mean, we actually, I'm, I'm saying, we did more than 50,000. I'm just from my office with volunteers, uh, volunteer physicians, volunteer nurses. We did them at churches. We did them at places like the By the Hand Club. Uh, I remember, I think 1500 was about the most we did in one day. But the West area, is kind of a health resources mecca. There are 23 hospitals in, we were in Maywood, Illinois the other night, and we was showing people how much money had come into Maywood. And we said healthcare in the last two years, $62 million. Wow. And somebody said, ah, oh, how could that be? Well, Iola. Medical Center, big hospital, medical center, medical school. Much of it, of course, goes there. But we also have more federally qualified health, health centers, centers in the district than you will find per capita anywhere in America other than perhaps in the Boston area where Senator Ted Kennedy was the greatest influence of any single individual making these things happen. I used to work for one. When I worked for one, My they, center. three of them were in Chicago. There were only 10 in the nation. Ten. Three of those 10 were in Chicago. I wrote the first proposal for one of them, the Martin Luther King Center, which initially was affiliated with Mount Sinai Hospital. And of course, access is the biggest of one. all of them around now. It too kind of originated out of Mount Sinai Hospital. But now there are 1,400 of these. 
across the country. Across the country, providing health services, medical services for between 25 and 30 million low and moderate income people Incredible. throughout America. I was fortunate and blessed and 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 just had a wonderful time because I was president of the National Association Come in. in the mid 1970s. And now this group undergirds primary health care in the United States of America. 25 to 30 million people. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of patient visits. And we are fortunate. We've got, oh my goodness, we got PCC Wellness Care near North, Mile Square, Esperanza, Alvisio, just Everybody. Erie Family. Just, I mean, wonderful places for people to go get health care. If they don't have any money, they still can go and get health care, get health services. I am going tomorrow because I have an MRI. Something okay. is wrong with <laughs> the, my shoulder. But, but I'm saying it has been wonderful to see the evolution and development and also to know that one is a part. I'm, I'm saying I've had a lot of great experiences working and, and, and one of my most enjoyable experiences has been working in the, the health movement. Uh, I know some of my constituents probably would never know that I've taught public health at the University of Illinois School of Public or that I've Illinois. taught at the University of Illinois Medical School. I used to co-teach something there called the realities of medicine with 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 my good friend Dr. Matt Zapter. And we just had wonderful times with medical students. But yeah, we've we we we've, we've been engaged, involved We've worked with all the different secretaries of health and human service. We actually had uh, Secretary Becerra yeah, right. here not long ago at Mount Sinai Hospital, but he's been here several times, right. many times. And individuals can say whatever relative to health. We've got great health needs because if you ain't healthy. I mean, there's nothing else which matters. I mean, you have all the millions of one. You don't have good health. It doesn't matter. No wonder, Congressman Davis, you are called as the father of readily mm -hmm. qualified health centers in the country today because of your passion, your enthusiasm, your focus driven, the expansion when you like you rightly said, from Three out of 10 federally health qualified centers in Illinois. Today, the country has 1,400 federally qualified health care centers. I know you started in the 70s as the president of the National Association of Community Health Care Centers. And some of the landmark legislation and congressional bills that you have signed off on and created is the Second Chance Act. It's I'm telling you, that's one of the most most pivotal uh, congressional bill today, which is transforming lives even today, which was initiated by you? Well, you know, there are so many people across the country who we have to thank for being able to pass that kind of legislation that puts a focus on how we can not only prevent crime, how we can reduce crime, but we can also reduce the dependence of large numbers of people on the public health. And if individuals who come out of jail and prison can get a job and work rather than being liabilities, they become 
Productive yeah. citizens, absolutely, because absolutely. Because they pay taxes if they got a job. Yeah. But if they can't get hired because they got a record, Rec exactly. Who's going to take care of them? <laughs> I That's mean. right. I mean, you're a great visionary. You think <laughs> out of the box, and you've created so much. Not only the, for, for the people of the seventh congressional district, but throughout the country, they are reaping the benefits of the legislation and the bills that you have passed. Well, I have to say that we are indeed proud to know that more than a billion dollars has been generated for programs that, that not-for-profits, the Cook County Department of Corrections, the Illinois Department uh -huh. of Corrections, outfits like the North Lundale uh, Employment Group, like the West Side Health Authority, like the Safer Foundation, and others have been able to get grant money to fund what they do. And when you hear individuals testify relative to how they have moved from a status of dependency to independency because they could get a job. They've had help with their anger management. They've had help with their substance use <coughs> issue. They've had help understanding that if you're going to get a job, you got to go to work at the same time every day. <laughs> 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 that you can't, you know, decide. Today, I'm going to work from 11 to 4, tomorrow, 3 to 9, or whatever. And, and so they've all gotten help, understand. And we take for granted that people just know this, but no, there are a lot of people who think that you can go whenever you get ready. You are incredible, <laughs> vibrant full of energy and still working for the people around the clock and take and you're transforming lives congressman through your legislation through your people to people contact like you said people from dependency to independency what second chance act has done bringing billions of dollars into the healthcare system which is very vital today and especially you talked about mental health crisis and now the friendly health friendly qualified healthcare centers have a division for behavioral health, Absolutely. which is which is, a, which is all thanks to your visionary insight. It's just not regular twenty four seven healthcare, but today behavioral health is a challenge America is facing, and you're providing solutions for it. And in the midst of all this, I would just like you to touch as we're concluding this interview about plantation politics. You know, we talked about on the West side, you know, you are now running for the, the 14th term of Congress. We need you, the people of the 7th Congressional District and people of America needs Congressman Danny K. Davis, who's a proven congressman who has provided vital action oriented bills and legislation who is here a great listener to resolve problems of his constituents and bringing jobs back to the west side and south side and also trying to restore the glory of the west side and south side with his dynamic mission and passion well you know we've actually had and i i nine bills asked nine of my bill and i say every one of them are important they've all been very helpful the interesting thing about being in congress is that it is so far away that oftentimes people don't see the connection for example there might be a building going up and the alderman might be there to cut the ribbon. The mayor might be there. Somebody who gave a bunch of money might be there. But most of those projects, there is some federal money Absolutely. in there. And yes. uh, the tax credits may not be mentioned. They, I mean, and so people won't know that the low-income housing tax credits were an integral part of the financing or the new market tax credits 
were a part of the financing. And so trying to make sure that people are educated to fully understand all of the connectivity that goes on in order to do development or in order to have a ribbon to cut. <laughs> I, I mean, we talk about it all the time in that there are things going on and the poor congressman will be sitting there watching somebody cut a ribbon and they've generated the money in order for the ribbon to be cut. You could but they're not mentioned. Yes, <laughs> they're, this is, you're, you're absolutely right. This is the congressman Danny K. Davis who performs, who actually he reforms and transforms and is working 24 seven his high energy and his dynamism in bringing money, finances, goals to his congressional district constituents. You can see it happening. All what he's doing every day. He has got 10,000, over 10,000 awards because people are honoring him and appreciating his service daily. You go to his office, which is in the hood, you see people knocking out, whether it's for any things from the city, state, county, and federal level. Here is a congressman who responds. It reminds me of the Bible verse, knock and it shall be open. Ask and it shall be given. And that's exactly what Congressman Danny K. Davis practices every day. And we want such a forceful fo force of epitome of honesty, integrity, and progress and prosperity for every one of the 7th Congressional District. You, we cannot have a better congressman who's delivering daily, who's responsive to your community needs, whether it's in Oak Park, whether it's in Maywood, whether it's in Inglewood, whether it's in the west side of Chicago, Garfield Park, Lawndale. Congressman Davis, now tell us, what would you say as you have got so many philanthropic awards, people are every day showering, acknowledging your leadership every day. Would any one particular over your term uh, of so many years, and I know you have many more years to continue, would you like to recall any one honor, which means everyone is great, but any one thing special? Well, I've got something called the Perrin Mitchell Award. And Perrin Mitchell used to be the congressman from Baltimore, Maryland. And he put a lot of focus on affirmative action and the creation of businesses in African-American communities. And I was on the small business committee way back. And we started something called a mentor's protege program. And there was a fellow out in Broadview, Illinois, where I am going in a few minutes for another one of our town, town hall meetings. meetings. We've been doing one every night. <laughs> <laughs> we were in Maywood, we were at Bellwood, we were in Oak Park, and tonight we'll be in Broadview. But all print was able to be a, 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 a protege of a of big printing company and they got the largest contract that they had ever had wow. in the history of the company and uh, we've been very proud of that but children are really my heart you know and the subcommittee that I rank on now, but chair when Democrats are. Family and... <laughs> yeah, family and workers support. And forward. Children are my heart. The songwriter said that our children are the future. And right now, we are focused on making sure that every child in the United States of America have access to early childhood education wow. so that they can get a head start and that they're not left behind as other children. Yeah, I was lucky I learned to read and lucky that I started reading and read my way up to a doctorate's degree and that kind of stuff. But, but what, what, what turns me on the most 
is when I can see little children who start at the very bottom, whose life does not appear, and then I see them 10 years later, and they're just doing great, they're doing wonderful. Then I see them and they say, I just graduated from Howard University, or I just graduated from Malcolm X, so I just graduated. And now I'm helping my little brother or my younger sister, or I'm tutoring the kids on the block. I've been fortunate to see a great deal of that, and that just warms my heart. So early childhood education, recognition, and, and, and work with those who need help the most. You just heard Congressman Danny K. Davis saying every child in the United States of America will have an equal opportunity for a strong early childhood education. And that's what Congressman Davis is doing today, striving, because that's so important. That builds the foundation, like he says, the, the of the each individual in America to make a strong prosperous America. We need every American child have a strong early childhood education, which Congressman Davis is striving for and fighting for and wants to ensure in the 14th congressional term of Congressman Davis. Congressman Davis, if you are, it was so glad to hear your one of your unfinished tasks is to make sure provide every child in America, irrespective of any race or color, should have a strong early childhood education. Friends, if all our children uh, have the best education, provide the equal opportunity for a great, strong early childhood education. That would be the answer to end violence. That would be the answer to end unemployment. That would be the answer to have a prosperous America. That would be the answer to make a strong uh, America. And that's what Congressman Danny K. Davis' unfinished task is, which he's working hard at. Congressman Davis, on a lighter note, if you are to take three people for dinner, the present or past, who would they be? Oh, my goodness. We eat all the food MacArthur has. <laughs> <laughs> MacArthur is one of his favorite. <laughs> but, you know, it would be wonderful to sit with Dr. Martin Luther King and, and, and hear some of what drove him to become the person he became. Yes. And to do the things that he yes, that. did. And I'd love, you know, Frederick Douglass has been my idol for a long Douglas. time. The most, oh, philosophically things I, 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 I cite and quote Frederick Douglass all the time. You know, he say, if nobody can ride your back if you ain't been over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, That's he right. also said great stuff. And I'd love to know how Franklin Delano Roosevelt came up with all of those great ideas. You know, there used to not be any social security. Uh -huh. There was no public housing. Uh -huh. There was none of this stuff did not exist. Because and, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt led us through the New Deal and, and, and we created approaches to dealing with poverty and to prevent people from being disillusioned and poverty stricken. So I could eat a whole lot of fried chicken. <laughs> the doctors probably wouldn't want to hear me say that. But but I'd love to be in the presence of those individuals, just as I'm in the presence of so many wonderful people each and every day, even in the alley, right. even in the pool room, even in the barber shop. And, and, and I get a lot of inspiration from them. You hearing the people's hero, the people's congressman, Danny K. Davis said, if three people he has given a chance to have dinner with in the past or present, Martin Luther King Jr., the freedom hero, philosopher Frederick Douglass, and of course, the most r President Franklin Roosevelt, who brought social security, who brought so many reforms, which we are all benefiting from today. Congressman Davis, 
in three words. You're such an enlightened, intellectual, creative genius. You're such a reformer, powerful orator, uh, action oriented person who walks the talk and your action speaks louder than your words. Though you're a powerful orator because you've done so much for the people and still doing and will continue to do and you are also have an epitome of honesty integrity your leadership is par excellence in three words how will you describe such an enzymatic personality like you i refer to you and everybody else as a living legend patience if you believe and have the patience to work towards what you believe. If you have virtue and integrity, and if you have perseverance, willing to keep moving, be positive. I thank my father for some of that because his favorite person in the Bible was Job. And any time yes. you went to him with a problem, he'd probably listen and he'd say, yeah, that sounds pretty bad. But did you ever think of Job? But, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what That's happened? a lot of patience, a lot of patience. <laughs> yeah. And so those are uh, attributes that I think helps one not only to be successful, but to enjoy all of the travesties, enjoy what they go through to get there. Great. C Congressman Danny Davis describes himself as determined, patience, and a unifier. And we will all continue to support Congressman Davis for many more terms in the Congress because we want you to have that passion, that determination, that integrity, that honesty, that unifier and inclusive leadership of everybody. You have a, such a diverse seventh congressional district from the Lake Shore, from the West Side, the Ukraine village, the Greek village, and you have a pocket of the Inglewood too. I mean, such a an Oak Park, Maywood, Bellwood. Uh, it's such a diverse seventh congressional district. You are the hope and the light for every one of your constituents and your light shines far beyond Chicago land. Like you rightly said, as the father of the federally qualified healthcare centers today, there are 14,000 healthcare centers, federally qualified, providing healthcare to 25 to 35 million low income citizens who no other way can get their healthcare. You have done this breaking second chance, which has allowed people who have gone to prison to get a second chance, to get jobs, to get their lives back in order, to contribute back into the tax system as normal citizens. You are true visionary Congressman Davis, and we are so thankful for you for joining us today on our show, giving, sharing your wisdom, sharing your enlightenment, and and especially your unfinished task that every child in America, not only in the seventh congressional district, should have a solid, strong early childhood education, which is the Panaka solution for all the problems we are facing today. Congressman Davis, your brief message to all the viewers of the Global Eye TV and at this talk show before we conclude. Keep believing that the best is yet to come oh, beautiful and if you believe it then you can achieve it beautiful. thank you so very much it's been my pleasure thank you so much congressman davis you shared so much of your wise wisdom with us it's incredible and we are thrilled to have you as a congressman and we're all going to work hard to continue to support you for the 13th 14th 15th term and onwards because you are young full of energy full of creativism and providing solutions to everyday problems of people and long-term vision. Thank you so much, Congressman Davis, for joining us. Thank you. Yeah.